Welcome back to uh, VMware Horizon introduction. Um, this is the second part, and we're going to continue by taking a look at the logical reference architecture. Now, this particular piece um, contains essentially what you would see in a traditional Horizon deployment. Um, and of course, your mileage may, how, how you actually do it uh, may vary depending upon your needs. Um, for example, we have RDS H farms, we have desktop pools, um, which may include link clones um, or insta clones. If you have link clones, you'll leverage things like Composer to build the link clones. But if you're not using link clones, then you won't have Composer. You'll have your application pools. These traditionally come off of your RDS H or through app volumes um, within the environment. You'll have at least two connection servers. And that's generally best practice in case of failover. Uh, we put a load balancer in front of those. And then you may have uh, two or more unified access gateways. This allows your users to connect into the connection servers uh, without necessarily needing special VPN access. So can be a good option for temporary employees or contractors that may need to access the environment um, externally. Uh, without having to provide special application or VPN access into the environment. Right? They could come in off through the internet, or they could be located within the organization. Right? And of course, underneath all of this would be VMware Virtual Center, along with ESXi for the hypervisor. So that's our logical uh, reference architecture. Now, this is actually um, in the reference architecture uh, guide is actually what we recommend is a deployment for an environment, particularly larger ones. But you can certainly have it scale for small, say a couple hundred desktops, um, up to very large, um, depending upon your needs. Now tied into this, of course, is licensing. Um, there are basically three license types. Um, we have our standard edition, uh, advanced edition, and the enterprise edition. Now standard edition comes uh, currently with Horizon, ThinApp, vSphere Desktop, vCenter Desktop, and of course the Blast protocols. Um, you can license it on a concurrent licensing basis. So this means the number of sessions I have into the environment will consume um, a license per session. Um, the uh, Vimer Horizon piece is, uh, of course, the VDI broker. Um, ThinApp, which is an app virtualization option, which allows you to decouple applications from the OS, and it allows you to be able to uh, package them up so that they can run on any Windows platform. Uh, vSphere Desktop and vCenter Desktops are special versions of uh, ESXi and uh, vCenter. Rather than having a licensing based on a per socket basis, these licenses are based on a per powered on virtual machine basis. And of course, it does come with the latest BLAST protocol as part of it. Now the advanced licensing includes all of that along with the Dandy Manager piece, the virtualization pack for Skype for business, um, vSAN for Horizon, and RDSH hosted applications. So this means that not only can I do RDSH um, uh, desktops, but I can also do applications. The vSAN for Horizon allows me to leverage um, vSAN as an option for storage for Horizon uh, environments. Um, the virtualization pack is a special piece which allows us to optimize uh, performance of Skype for Business uh, within the environment. And then Identity Manager allows us to be able to provide options when it comes to allowing users to log in. So when they log into their environment, rather than having to re-log in uh, multiple times and against multiple applications, they only need to log in once and a token will be created that will allow them to be logged into their SaaS applications, their application pools, and their desktop pools. Now, this particular licensing has both concurrent and named user licensing. So as I mentioned, concurrent uh, licensing is based on the sessions, where named user is based on the user themselves. So um, with concurrent, if a user has five different connections, that will uh, consume five licenses. But with named user, it's based on the user themselves. So they could have five connections, but it only assumes one license. So you choose the appropriate license for your environment in that scenario. Last but not least is the Enterprise Edition. 
this edition includes everything with it, essentially. So in addition to the what we see in the events and the standard licenses, we also get uh, vRealize Operations Manager for Horizon, the vRealize Automation Plugin, which we can uh, let us leverage, vRealize uh, Automation and vRealize Orchestrator for the environment, App Volumes, User Environment Manager, and Horizon for Linux. So with the vRealize Operations, this allows us to actually monitor the environment um, to ensure the desktops and applications are performing at their best. Uh, the vRealize Automation plugin allows us to automate the process of creating workflows for creating our desktops, our pools, and so on. App Volume allows us to provision out our applications to the environment, and User Environment Manager allows us to uh, manage the profiles a user may have. Horizon for Linux allows us to be able to leverage Linux, uh, Linux clients as well as Linux desktops. So there's a variety of Linux um, uh, distributions that we support. Um, and this means that if you want to leverage a Linux desktop uh, within the environment, uh, you can certainly do that. Now, it isn't enough to go and just build a desktop and give it to a user and hope everything's OK. In fact, that's a bad practice. Uh, the best practice is to actually start with the use case. That is. How is the user, what the user needs to do for their day-to-day -day activity, going to leverage the software and hardware within the environment? That combination of things may result in a different experience, or basically results in what we call a use case. Um, and within the use case, there's even different workloads um, for it. For example, how I might use presentation software might be very different than how a colleague of mine might use presentation software. And so because of our different needs uh, and different uh, requirements for our day-to-day -day jobs, um, that may result in having a different desktop need uh, for the environment. So it's a good idea to sort of map out um, how the users use their software and their hardware to create what we call use cases. Um, we have a couple of examples for defining use cases. So in our first use case, um, all the office employees basically um, uh, ha work with sensitive data uh, within the environment. So because of that, USB access and clipboard redirection is not allowed. But we have certain users, executives, that do need to have USB access. Now, they actually are classified under an office worker category um, with secure internal communication um, and the various applications that they need. But because of that special USB access, we would create a separate use case for them that would identify the per peripheral needs that they need that would, be, would not be part of the normal office worker needs. Now with use case two, we have senior executives that work from home. Um, with that comes some other challenges. They have to have specific uh, configurations that support uh, a remote uh, connection, um, along with uh, taking into consideration the potential for network latency and bandwidth reductions. Um, and that may not be always an easy thing to have. What they may have in one area may be different in different areas. And so we'll sort of have to consider that. So we put them under workload category of senior executive um, with the connectivity classification of internal or external. And then what applications and devices they may need with them. Now there are different workload categories. Uh, we give a few examples here as the more common ones that we do see. Uh, probably the most common one we see is a static task worker. So you can think of this person as being sort of uh, a call center, for example, or uh, you know, if you go to a hotel, the reception area where you register um, to get your hotel key and so on. Uh, these types of roles are roles that generally are shift work, right? think nine to five. Um, where the user might have limited application combinations. So maybe they have two or three applications that they use, and that's it. Um, quite often, it tends to be data entry um, and very straightforward. Uh, so that tends to be one of the easiest ones to sort of configure as far as a workload or use case. Our mobile knowledge worker is like the average office worker, but they have a special need because they're on the road. Uh, for example, myself, when I travel, I go through airports and I go to various hotels. And so my connection to the network 
maybe sporadic. It will depend on my day, where I am, where um, and whether I'm at a place that actually has network access. And so I have to take into consideration those types of needs or that type of workload scenario. Now, when we get to power user types, um, that can actually be broken down into really two types of power users. You can think of software developers or IT. Uh, their type of workload um, not only requires them to have uh, more CPUs and more memory, but they may also need special uh, permission or allowances to install software, uh, particularly for software developers. It's very different than what a multimedia designer or engineer needs. Um, in those cases, because of the need to create high definition video and or audio, their requirements will be very different. They may need even a special graphics card to support uh, their desktop environment. And last but not least is a contractor. Now this is an external user. They're kind of similar to um, our mobile knowledge worker, kind of like an average office worker, but they tend to have more restrictions on them because of the risk of the fact that they are a, a, a sort of employee, if you will, but from outside the company, right? And so in these cases, there's some things that they'll have access to and some things they don't. And quite often it's security that sort of puts the restrictions down. Now, once I've built all of my use cases and I know what the mix of applications and peripherals, et cetera, are, I can now create a table similar to the one that we have, which is called a use case attribute table. From this, I'll be able to build my pools of desktops within the environment. So, uh, for example, we have, you know, user community, business unit. In this example, we call it call center. Um, business justification for the desktop, the lower cost of desktop refresh, and so on. So I can actually see very quickly how many users I'll need within the pool, how big the pool will need to be. Type of user will then tell me the type of desktop they need, whether they need to have special graphics, do they need remote access, um, and so on. And so it is worthwhile to actually, for each of your use cases, build something similar. Um, as a result, you'll be able to take advantage and be able to see where can I use the same master image or gold image within the environment um, and leverage the same pool types across different use cases, making it easier for administration of the environment. So now that you've gone through this uh, section, you should be able to recognize some of the features and benefits of Horizon itself. You should be able to talk about the conceptual and logical architecture of the environment. You should be able to find a use case and workload um, for both the virtual desktops and or the applications and then take their customer requirements and turn it into use case attributes. Some of the key takeaways to keep in mind, right? Horizon virtualizes desktops within a virtual infrastructure environment, right? It's a packaged VDI uh, product, which allows you, to, allows you to control, manage, and provide access to desktops and applications from a single point, right? Uh, we support a variety of operating systems, remote access protocols, and management tools. We actually can provide the desktops and applications automatically and in real time. And in fact, we can provide just-in-time uh, desktops through the use of the Instant Clone technology. You can personalize user settings and their experience on their desktops through the use of User Environment Manager and leverage applications um, through the use of app volumes. And then once you've defined your use case, you can actually apply the capabilities that Horizon is able to provide to the use case to define how you build your pools within the environment. So this will conclude our introduction into Horizon, and we'll see you next time.